We have a real treat in store for you this morning um, with three of the heavyweights, metaphorically speaking, of ethics and law in Singapore. Um, they need no introduction, but I will introduce them as they go. The focus is on end-of-life care, and we're particularly interested in thinking about how the concept of best interests might be thought about in these very serious matters where the decision is about whether we sustain or end a patient's life. Do the same legal and ethical considerations apply when we make decisions of these kinds? Do we need to deviate or develop the considerations that were introduced yesterday? We'll focus on issues around minors' care. In particular, in this session, we'll look at life-sustaining treatment decisions for severely impaired newborn babies. How do we think about those decisions where weighty and knotty questions about the value, the fundamental value of a human life are going to be in play by the bedside and in the clinic? And we'll also think about how very practically to address tensions around the conflicts that can arise between professionals responsible in making these decisions and, of course, also between those professionals and family members, where conflict is so commonly a feature of these, of these matters, and how the impact on the professionals themselves should be addressed, worked through, and such like. So, enough from me. Without further ado, our first heavyweight, Lalit Krishna. Thank you very much for being here today. Uh, this is a great pleasure. Um, so, I want to tell you a little story. So, my talks are usually fireside chats, so this setup is actually very different from what I usually do. And um, the reason why I do this is because I'm going to introduce a whole new perspective of best interest. Okay, and it's this part of the story that probably never gets told. So, let's start. So, I am going to focus on cases and very specifically on best interests and very specifically on palliative care, okay? So we're talking about patients with a prognosis of less than two months. So here's the case. It's a case in a palliative care setting. So I'm a palliative care physician. I need to tell you that the case has been changed significantly and I'm going to provide you with new insights into new data um, from studies that we are carrying out. Unfortunately, oh, sorry, yeah, I thought it was loud enough. Um, unfortunately, I'm unable to share the, the data with you because uh, we haven't got approval from the uh, sponsors for the study. It takes 60 days to get those. Um, the other thing is the opinions that I share today are my own. Uh, the purpose of this uh, talk is to actually uh, provoke an exchange of ideas. So it's purposely um, there to incite a little bit of uh, response, emotional response with you, for you. Any hurt ca caused or misunderstanding that arise is not intentional. Oh, I must apologize for my very dark humor as well. So I'm going to start off with a very simple history. This is a 65-year-old gentleman. He's single. <coughs> Let's just cut to the chase. He's got irretrievable heart, renal, and vascular disease. He's not well at all, okay? He's an inpatient hospice. He has no caregiver at home. Now, this is the problem. He's got a prognosis of two months, and he says, I want to go home. And the problem is he can't self-care. The problem is he has no caregiver. He does, however, have capacity. He knows that he needs help with medication. He needs help to mobilize. So what would you do? Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you this. He's got bilateral above-knee amputations. 
He lives in a one-bedroom flat. He's not had any rehab yet. He cannot self-care. And he does not want any strangers in his house. So this is where we visit the problem. The problem is this. We've got patient choice versus team distress. This, was, this is a case uh, I saw when I was very young to Singapore. So I've been here for 18 years. Uh, I think I saw this case within the first year I came from London. Effectively, the debate that we faced was, should we respect this patient's choice? Or should we be paternalistic? I mean, we couch it under VAA now. And maybe that justifies what we did, or did try and think about. And you know the requirements for MCA and VAA. We spoke about it yesterday. What we did was, we were thinking about how to address this issue. And, um, it was a very difficult issue, and it was something that I discussed with my colleagues and my team. And one of the things that we were proposing is the welfare model, which is a multidisciplinary-based de decision-making process. So I'm going to ask you, before I get into the welfare model, if it was you, if you were the consultant that had to make that decision as to whether or not this patient goes home, what would you do? I'm, put you, I'm going to give you a little bit more context. This gentleman has above knee amputations. He cannot mobilize. If I send him home, he's going to be on a bed. He doesn't want caregivers to come into his house. The reason why he doesn't want to have caregivers into his house is because he's got a familial shrine in his house. He doesn't want it, he doesn't want people who have eaten meat or maybe who don't understand his family or will stare. He didn't want all of that. For him, this is important. If I took him home, how would he get food? More importantly, if he went home, even with diapers, who would change his diapers? This is what we were facing. So, hence, I'm going to ask you a simple question. Here's the poll. Take your time. But I want you to try and answer this question as if you are the one making that final decision. So, I didn't give you a chance to fence it. So please vote. It's anonymous. I love the fact that the yeses are just like, uh, yes, no, maybe uh, 48, 49. All right, I'm going to stop this in about another minute. Another, how many minutes has it been? How many minutes has it been open for? Yeah. No, I'm sure. No, I'm sure. You see, the, the thing about it is, right, as a palliative care physician, the buck stops with you. And that's the point. The point I'm trying to make in a minute is what happens. Okay? I'm going to stop. So it's 51 to no and 49 to yes. Oh, well, 48. Okay, maybe I shouldn't have said anything. Okay. All right, let me get back to my slides. Do you ever wonder, so shall I quickly tell you about what we did? Well, maybe not. I'll tell you in a minute. I've discussed this case in four settings. Maybe what I should tell you about is the most recent, where we discussed it in a group of palliative care physicians, trainees, doctors, very senior doctors. Uh, 
And the answer was majority no. You would not let the patient go home. And you've got to remember that this is nearly 20 years ago. There was no support. You've got to remember that this is 20 years ago when um, people on the ground were in shortage. I mean, we still are. What bothered me most wasn't the decision. What bothered me most was the emails that followed. And the emails that followed were purely on how do you do this? So the sponsor I was telling you about the study I'm doing is I'm, I've got a reasonably big grant from Medical Protection Society this year looking at how doctors deal with death and dying and how it impacts their decision making. So I want you to consider the issues before I talk to you about why we made the decision not to send him home. I've looked, I've published two papers now. The first paper is on how nurses in palliative care deal with death and dying. The second paper, uh, I'll give you the references in a minute. The second paper was on how palliative care physicians deal with death and dying. The third one, is on medical oncologists. The fourth one is on geriatricians. The fifth one is on geriat uh, sorry, a &E doctors. And these are all coming and, and hence the reason why I can't share the, the data yet. We know that there's a competitor paper coming out as well, so hence the reason why my colleagues didn't want to share it. I think they just don't like me, but there you go. So let me, let me share what I can share. These are the things that palliative care physicians deal with every day. You break bad news, you withhold or withdraw treatment, and then you justify it. You justify it, and that's the point. You justify it to the family, you justify it to the patient, and then you justify it to yourself. Palliative care physicians deal with collusion. They deal with intrusive family members. So I, I sit at, as the ethics chair for NCC. Um, recently, there was a family that actually slapped a doctor, not once, but twice, uh, because they didn't get what they wanted. We've had palliative care doctors being spat on. We've had palliative care doctors being abused. This is what you deal with. We have, um, we wrote about this, uh, we've had cases where families have demanded irrational, I, well, from my perspective, my humble perspective, rather irrational choices stuff that they bought online that they think that would help their loved ones to be given, to, to be force fed through an NG. Only problem is the tumor is actually in the esophagus and I don't know how anyone would have put an NG in. This is what we deal with. The impact is moral distress. My data shows that about 80% of palliative care physicians at any one time suffer moral distress in one form or another. That level of moral distress is significantly higher amongst oncologists. There's a sense of failure, especially for the oncologists who actually feel as if, you know, my treatment didn't work, I have failed. It's a helplessness. I'm a coward. I will tell you that now. I can't do palliative care in pediatrics. When I trained in the UK, I looked after this child as part of my training, and he was seven years old. 
And he was dying, and he was dying horribly, and there was a lot of pain. And he asked me, by the way, no one can pronounce my name, right? So I'm Lala, named after one of the Teletubbies. <laughs> so it was, Dr. Lala, why can't you take my pain away? That was on my second week of a six-month posting. I need to tell you that I used to play rugby. I weighed 110 kilos. You do not want to meet me anywhere, and let alone on the rugby field. During that six months, to deal with everything, it took, it, it's an hour drive across London and, a, and an hour drive back. Every morning, I would be this close to tears. And the only way I could cope was to run along the river. By the time I finished my six-month posting, I was 80 kilos. I also had about 2% body fat, but that's not going to go into that. Uh, the impact is huge. There's loss. Many of us have relationships with our patients. We build those. Part of the reason why I'm going back today is day after tomorrow, which is Sunday morning, I'm meeting a friend of mine. Uh, I've known him since he was seven. His father used to help ferry me to school and back. Father's dying. We're going to have the ACP conversation. I don't know whether I can have that with a straight face. There's compassion fatigue. My second study that will be published this year shows that in palliative care nurses, at any one time in a three-year cycle, there'll be at least one period in which they su su suffer significant compassion fatigue. Amongst oncologists, it's in a, every two-year cycle. In palliative care, well, what's the data? There is a dread. Give you a little bit of history. I trained to be a gynecologist. My interest was ovarian cancer. I, um, I changed my mind after working with midwives. They're living proof that we're not alone in the universe. I did palliative care simply because part of my oncology training was, uh, sort of my gynae training was we went through oncology. And um, it was Christmas day, I was stuck, we were snowed in, I was stuck, and I was stuck with a patient with mycosis fungoides. It was a hugely difficult patient to deal with because she was in so much pain. I spent 56 hours of my shift with her. Yeah, so in the UK, when you're on call, for a weekend, you start at 9 o'clock on Saturday, and you finish at 5 o'clock on Monday. We got snowed in, so I didn't get cover until Tuesday. I can tell you, honestly, I used to drink a bottle of Nescafe a week. Um, and I struggled with her. She was in so much pain. She was crying. The nurses were distressed. The doctors were distressed. I was an MO. Barely spell my name. And then on Tuesday, I called the palliative care doctor. He came. He cycled in in the freaking snow and came in and saw this patient. One hour after he started seeing the patient, she was pain-free. Two hours after he saw the patient, she had her first meal. Three hours after he saw the patient, she was with her family for the first time in a week. I quit gynae then. I haven't regretted it. This is the job. I love this job. I wouldn't say you should do it because you want, it's going to pay well because it doesn't. Um, but it's a wonderful job. But the reason why I tell you this is because the burden of the decisions that you make sometimes make you dread coming to work. Okay, I've killed the... Clicker, dearly beloved, we're here for the, all right. So 
there is regret in our population. 12% of palliative care doctors wish they weren't palliative care doctors anymore. That's this year's data. Oh, sorry, last year's data, sorry. Dementia. 40% of oncologists don't want to be oncologists anymore. 60% of nurses don't want to be nurses anymore. So now, I want to tell you why we make the decisions we make. When we talk about best interests, here's the issue. We could have sent that patient home. And we could have said, yeah, well, it's his choice. But the problem is that justifying, right? It's that justifying to yourself. I was trained by Dame Cicely Saunders. I actually was part of my rotation at St. Christopher's when she passed away. But the person who had the most influence on my career is Cynthia Goh. And she used to tell me a simple thing. Treat the patient as if he was, he or she is your loved one. What would you want? See, that's the problem, right? I could have sent this patient home and not thought about it. But if it was my loved one, I would think about it. How do you justify it to yourself? What the data shows now is this. Our junior doctors, up to the PGY3, PGY4, they will let the patient go home because it's autonomy. Because people like me teach her autonomy. Must respect. I was going to blame Mikey, but he might kill me. Um, but here's the interesting part. Consultants are less likely to say yes. Nurses are even less likely to say yes. Social workers say no. Because when you ask them why, when you sit down and you have an hour-long conversation with large boxes of tissue paper, it's what you tell yourself. It's how you sleep at night. It's not an issue I have. I don't sleep. Um, so here's the thing I want to share with you. It's a work in progress, but I want you to think about this for yourself. I'm a medical educationalist first, as much as I am a palliative care physician. And the goal of medical education is to change the way you practice. So I have upset most people here. And for that, forgive me. I hope most of all that I made you think. Think about why you make the decisions you make and how you must deal with that. This theory is called the Krishna Pisupati model. And basically, I'm not going to go into it. I will give you the references for these articles. But basically, what you see there in the circles there is your concept of yourself, who you are, what makes you you. And what makes you you is your religious beliefs, your relationships with your family, your roles in society. So this concept brings with it your beliefs, your values, your principles. When you face constant barrage of emotional, compassion fatigue, Moral distress, they challenge your belief system. The impact is it changes the way you make decisions about your willingness to address an issue that is difficult. The impact at the end of it is that it changes the way you look at yourself.
If you don't see this, please see it now. If you're already feeling this, talk to someone you, you think you can or get help. I'm a hardcore Liverpool fan. And the thing about it is, I believe that all palliative care physicians should be Liverpool fans simply because our motto is, you never walk alone. <laughs> the reason for this talk was simple. Making a best interest decision is a decision that touches your soul, touches who you are. Making a best interest decision, you might do it daily, but there's a cost. It may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, but it's somewhere in the future. What you need to do is to think about how you look after yourselves. Most of you are too precious. I can't replace palliative care physicians. Most people uh, don't want to do it. I can't replace my family medicine physicians. I can't replace my geriatricians. But maybe that's not what I'm really interested in. What I'm afraid of is that if we don't look after ourselves, you become someone else, something else. I want to leave you with one quote. So this is a quote from a nurse. And she said basically, and this was at the lowest point of her burnout. And she said, you know, this family, they were crying, they were angry. The daughter was dying. She was 19 years old. I felt sorry for them. I felt sorry for her, but I can't feel anything for them now. I can't feel it, I don't care. I just can't deal with it. I want to tell you a little bit about what we did for that man in the end, since I'm sure you would want to know. The nurses, the doctors, we pulled our money together, we went in, we got food, and we, the nurses went in daily to look after this man on their own time. And the doctors did home visits and he died within a week. He died with dignity. He died pain-free. And the most important thing was he didn't die alone. Thank you. Um, thanks, Lale. That was a really moving, very personal account of what's at stake in these decisions and how the professionals have to address them. Um, as Lale mentioned, he does have to leave, unfortunately, to go to KL this afternoon, or in fact later this morning. Um, we have 10 minutes of time available, so I'm going to devote that time for people to ask a short amount of questions to Lale if they would like to do so. So if anybody has a particular question... So how do you Very simple. Yeah, I scared the living daylight. This is the devil. They look at me. Uh, I, I, I told him simply this: If you were my brother, I wouldn't leave you like this. So, if you want to go home, this is one condition: Let me come in. And when he died, he died at 3 a.m. He died with the nurse holding his hand, and I just managed to get in, and he was very comfortable. Anybody else like to ask a a question? We do have mics going around. We have the mics here as well. So please do feel free to come up. It's your last chance to speak to Lalit before he leaves. Yeah, we have a question there. So, Kuala Lumpur. So my question is, when you talk about justifying, so we make... When I talk about what, sorry? Justifying. Oh, justifying, yeah. So a lot of time we are in the grey zone 
We are trying to analyze the situation and justify ethically. Uh, this is not easy, especially we always ask ourselves, we have to answer to ourselves. But there are a lot of voices around. When we have MDTs, we are seeing distress in our colleagues in other teams. So what would be your advice for us um, when we are facing a difficult decision make, decision making situation. It is 50-50 whether you choose, choose option A or option B. I had conversations with uh, most of the team on a one-to-one -one basis. I asked them how much they, oh, this has gone off. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, sorry, I asked them simply what was their motivation, what were their concerns? Was this because of themselves or what they were worried about? What I'm trying to tell you is that in our team, we have regular case discussions, debriefs. Um, and in, in cases where we face this, these type of conversations are regular. For example, if you're doing a terminal sedation, for example, uh, these are discussions that you would have. Um, it's never easy, but I I'll tell you the big secret. The big secret is, you have a team in which, who is comfortable in sharing their opinions. Um, sorry. Yes, uh, and, and it's just getting them to share those conversations and, and then maybe do a debrief after that. Sorry, not a perfect answer. It's work in progress. Thank you. A uh, question here, I think, first, to the gentleman with the shirt on, have the microphone. <laughs> well done, mate. I changed my name. I'm a vascular surgeon from Australia. I live in Singapore, but I work there. And I actually do the AKAs and all that sort of stuff uh, yeah. over there. Uh, That's great work that you've been doing. And I always tell uh, my patients and their families that uh, approaching palliative care is not a bad word at all. It's actually helping the patient if we actually refer them early for your help. And that was really good work on how you volunteered your time to get to the patient's family and, uh, sorry, to the patient's home to care for him. Ha has anything good come out of that, as in any sort of uh, progress in, in Singapore? That, you know, some sort of hospital in the home sort of set up for such patients? And... You can have this one. Okay, I'll try not to kill this one as well. All right, um, so I'm Malaysian uh, and, and uh, been here in Singapore for the last uh, 18 years now. You've seen, we've seen a humongous explosion of uh, support from the government. Um, I wish it was happening in my country, um, but we have wonderful home care teams that are continuing to develop we are continuing to, to recruit uh, staff. We are now going into, uh, we've developed our hospices, we've improved home care uh, for patients, access to palliative care has improved as well. Uh, but I think the other thing about it is that we also have uh, facilities now for, for patients to be cared for at home with 24 seven care for at least about a week or two. Yeah, so we've come a long way, uh, but the issues I'm afraid maybe have evolved in the complexities as well. Thank you. OK, time for one final question before we move on. Yeah, Lalit, so uh, Zini from Malaysia Palliative Care. I, I congratulate the team for doing what they could uh, under difficult circumstances. But the reality is that, for example, you know, if I have 400 patients living in the community and out of the 400 patients, maybe 10 to 20 of them do not have carers at home. And, you know, as a team, we want to do our best to cater to uh, patients' needs, but the reality is we are not gonna be able to do that every time when we identify that needs are not met. And I think the other point I want to make is, um, uh, Harvey Chorchinov recently talked about uh, the platinum rule rather than the golden rule. So instead of using our own um, barometer to assess 
you know, what the patient's needs are. And in this situation, clearly, um, you know, it's best to have kept him in a hospice because you have the safety of the whole team to look after him. But, um, you know, if we were to use uh, Chorchinov's uh, concept of platinum rule, then, um, you know, maybe sending him home is the right thing to do. So I'd just like to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah. Um, I, no, thank you. Um, I think part of the problem is, for us, um, is uh, another level of thought which I, I did not share with you earlier. So there's a, we talk about you know, respecting the patient, right? And then we talk about our own self-interest, right? But there's also uh, physicians, uh, and, and, and actually most, more so with nurses, there's also a very rooted sense of duty to society. And this duty to society varies, as you can imagine, as a sociocultural construct. But um, from the people I interviewed, they, the, the nurses felt that you know, all life is important and we cannot just let it slip away or die unattended. And so for the nurses, they felt that this, this, there was this need for them to protect life. Um, and so that it's that other layer that prevents them from doing what they, or rather tips them to, to be more paternalistic, if you like. And I'm using that word very loosely. Um, it's a hard one to deal with. Um, if you give me about another six months, I'll have a better answer for you. Um, the interviews are ongoing. Um, actually, maybe I'll do a pitch here. If you're from any country other than Singapore, if you want to reach out and if you're interested in doing this, we are expanding our studies, and that's my email. Um, uh, yeah, we're interested in how doctors deal with death and dying all around. The problem right now is most of the data comes from the West and maybe not exactly applicable to us. Can I run away now? <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Me a wonderful audience. <laughs>